Uh, my name is Linda Hall. I'm one of the co-founders and president of Connected Community. <clears throat> we were founded in 2013 by four moms who wanted to build a better life for their own children with disabilities as well as others like them. Through our four areas of service, which are educational outreach, social and service opportunities, creative day services and employment, we strive to help families prepare for and navigate the transition out of educational entitlements and into what we hope will be a full and meaningful life in the community. I want to take a minute to introduce our CTC board members that are here today. Uh, Co-founder and director Barb Tobias is in the back taking pictures. Uh, Co-founder and director Mary Hansen is here someplace. There she is over on the side. Director Sandy Ricketts is checking people in at the door. Uh, director Judy Sinais who's doing double duty here with uh, the commission, and our employment specialist, Colleen Getz, who's also out at the registration table. Um, we're always looking for new people to get involved with Connected Community, so if you're interested in being on our board or volunteering in another way, we'd love to have you just reach out and we'll put you to work, I guarantee it. Um, I wanna recognize our two partners in this, uh, this event. First is the Village of Hoffman Estates and their commission for people with disabilities. The village allows us to use this beautiful room, which we really appreciate, and the commission generously provides our morning refreshments, tech support, videography, and more. So everybody who's here from the commission or other volunteers from the village, do you want to stand up and be recognized? I appreciate it. They're all hanging out over there somewhere. We put them to work, too. Our second event partner is NSSEO, the Northwest Suburban Special Education Organization. NSSEO has been a partner of Connected Community pretty much since day one, and we appreciate their support over the years. They print all of our seminar materials and they handle the registration and administration of uh, our continuing education credits for those professionals who are here today. So thank you so much, NSSEO. Um, and finally, we want to publicly thank Palatine Township, who generously helps us with our educational outreach initiative, funding our events, which include free monthly Friday forums and informational tours, as well as this annual transition summit. Their support allows us to keep our costs low so we can keep our events as accessible to people as possible. Uh, a few notes about today's format. Because we have a really tight agenda, we ask you to please hold your questions to the end of each presentation, and we'll get to as many as we can while still keeping on our agenda format. Um, in addition, in order to save time, behind your agenda in your event folders are the biographies for all of our speakers. Please take a look. Look at all the accomplishments that these people have. It's amazing. And it allows me to keep my introductions very short <laughs> and succinct. So take a look at those when you have a chance. Okay, so let's get started. Today's event is about housing. And like so many things in the disability world, it's not a one-size-fits-all proposition. What's an ideal housing situation for my son may be a disaster for yours, and vice versa. So today we're gonna start with an overview of kind of what different options are available in the state of Illinois, and then we're going to take kind of a deeper dive into some maybe more unique or things that you haven't really heard about before to give you some information that hopefully you can use. So while not every topic is going to apply to your family's situation, we hope that when you leave today you'll have at least some information that will help you in making you know, more decisions and getting your journey started to find the right housing fit for you. All right. Based in Peoria since 1950 and now serving 15 counties, EPIC is a community of families, staff, and volunteers, as well as community members working together to support individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their families. Their host homes program, one of the largest in Illinois, matches adults with IDD with host families in the community of their choice. Host families provide more than just a place to live by offering individualized support, encouraging independence, and providing immersion in the community. This is something I've really been interested in learning about. I don't know anything about it, so I hope you feel the same. So we're going to welcome Alyssa Newman, who's EPIC Community Options Recruiter, and Jessica Thompson, EPIC Placement Specialist, who are going to help us learn about the Host Homes Program. Ladies. Hello everyone, nice to see you all today. Such a beautiful day to have this presentation going. 
All right, so as we were introduced, I am Jessica. I am the placement specialist for Epic. Um, I have been with Epic for going on six years now. I started out as a CDSQ, worked my way into our host home program, and now I'm the placement specialist. And this is my coworker, Alyssa. Good morning, everyone. My name is Alyssa Newman. Um, I am our, sorry, I am really short, so. <laughs> I am our community options recruiter. Um, I started at Epic about two years and three months ago. Um, I started when I did my internship with college, and then from there I was the placement specialist, and then I was promoted to the community options recruiter. All right. So without further ado, we're going to get started. Okay. So on this screen, we have a couple of our individuals and our host home providers, and we will point out a lot of this stuff as we go through, so don't get too caught up on anything. Um, so on a regular basis, you will find the people that we support in the community involved with their host home provider or their host home family. Um, we have a lot of individuals that will volunteer, they want community jobs, or they want to be in a CDS program. We currently have over 70 individuals working in community jobs. Um, they really enjoy being social. They don't like being stuck in the houses. You know, they want to be in the community just like you and I do. Okay, go ahead. Um, so just like you and I, the people we support, they have goals in life. Um, they enjoy in participating in activities that we would, um, and they also um, they also receive the support from our staff, our host home providers, and their parents. So in these photos, you'll see um, that we have quite a few people who have different goals. Um, on the far right there, or your left, uh, his goal was to get a community job, save up, purchase a car, and get his license. Um, and he did that with the support from his team. Other people, it might just be going to a baseball game or getting a first pet, whatever it be, we support them through that. And then we also have um, a really cool thing that we have seen as a pretty hot commodity with the people that we support. And they are our host home vacations. Um, so what happens is every other month we put on a vacation for the people in our services. And they, we have a meeting at the beginning of the year. We ask them, you know, where would you like to go? Where are places that you have always wanted to go to that you haven't been able to do on your own? So we compile a list of these places that they, you know, they've always wanted to go to and we try to make it happen for them. Um, so each month, um, I think this year we're doing every other month now because we're doing a little bit of bigger trips. Uh, we are going to, let's see, this year they're getting ready to go to Graceland, Tennessee next weekend. So they're going to go, you know, visit Elvis's house. Um, really excited about that. They're not too excited about the car ride, but <laughs> they're really excited to go see, you know, everything Elvis. We have a lot of Elvis enthusiasts. Um, we went to the St. Louis uh, City Museum, the St. Louis Zoo. We went to a Cub card game last year, and they got to sit in uh, some pretty nice seats that I don't think I could even get into. Um, we go to Wisconsin Dells, the water parks up there. Um, I was able to send one of our guys to Harry Potter World uh, down in Disney. That was always one of his dreams. Again, I was very jealous because that's something that I want to do. Um, so we have a lot of opportunities for our guys to go out and do the vacations. And part of being in the host home, uh, the host home provider helps them you know, pick out what trips they want to go on. They find out how much the, how much the trips are. Uh, they go through prioritize which ones they want to do the most, and then they start doing a savings program so they can afford those trips. Um, and even if they aren't able to afford them full, you know, right up front, we do do like a payment option for them to make it a little bit easier. Um, let's see. We also do, I think we have a couple pictures in here, yeah. We also have what is called power teams, and that's basically um, kind of like an aftercare, you know, like after, uh, workshop is over or maybe after they're done with their community job one time a week. Um, so at 3 o'clock they come into our day program area and they're able to participate in our 
power team, which is some fun activity that they have planned again. Um, so it might be going to paint pottery at the local pottery house. Maybe it's going to the movies because you know the new Batman came out and they won't really want to go see it. Um, other times it's going to the park and we're just going out and hiking and having fun. Or we're staying in when we're playing games or doing a karaoke night. We did just have our southern office. Uh, they were able to go to a karaoke bar and one of our guys, like I said, he was an Elvis enthusiast, and he got up on the bar and started karaokeing and had a blast. <laughs> so it's a lot of great opportunities for our individuals, and they don't have to attend these if they don't want to. It's their choice, but it is a social outing for them, and any time they're able to come out and see their friends, it's a usually a pretty good time. All right. So just a little bit about um, EPIC and how it got started. Um, EPIC's foundation was laid 70 years ago when a group of Peoria area parents wanted to provide more education and opportunity to their children. Um, during that time, having a disability determined a child's future. So it became an opportunity for change and growth for them. A school was established where the kids could discover their potential and no matter what their diagnosis was, they were encouraged to cultivate their abilities. And then after 1960, EPIC became a National ARC affiliate, um, it, and it continued to grow and expand its services until 2013 when we changed our name to EPIC, which stands for Empowering People and Inspiring Capabilities. Um, what started as a very small group of parents that wanted better for their children has grown to be so much more. EPIC has enriched the lives of over 600 people with varying disabilities. Um, the support extends to families as well. We offer support through care, information, and encouragement. We are headquartered in Peoria, Illinois, so that is where our main day program is. We offer um, quite a few different um, services during the day. So we have community day services. We have power teams, which Jess just spoke about community employment services where we provide job coaching and help people through the process of searching for a job. Um, we have our Harvest Garden where we're contracted with multiple different local restaurants and they purchase our produce. Um, we have educational services. We have a technology lab. We have our Epicasso art program where artists make commission off of the pieces that they sell. Um, we also offer certificate programs in culinary, horticulture, technology, life skills, and pre-employment. And in December of 2018, we acquired an office in Swansea, Illinois. Um, it is smaller than our Peoria area. However, they also offer employment services and host homes as well. Okay, so as you can see, the map of Illinois, anywhere where you see a green exclamation point, that is a county where we provide host home services. Um, so we are as far north as Stark County, um, as far south as St. Clair County, um, and still expanding. Um, so our EPIC host home program, it assists adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities in finding a home designed to encourage independence as much as possible. Um, and in the most natural setting. So again, group homes, they're kind of natural settings. I mean, you and I, we do not live in group homes. We live in an actual home. This is a um, actual home a provider has opened up to, up to two individuals. Um, so the provider could be single, they could be married, they could have kids, they might not have kids, they could have pets, they might not have pets. It's anybody who is willing to open up their home and they can support up to two people at one time. Um, our individuals are required to have their own bedroom so they have their own space. And the provider it serves as a 24 seven point of support for that person um, to help support as much as they need or as little as they need. Now, um, our host homes has been in operation, I believe a little over 45 years. And then we have served over uh, 75 people in our host homes department currently um, and counting. We are currently admitting more and more people to our host homes and we are growing that department. Um, like Alyssa said, we are located our main offices in Peoria and Swansea, Illinois. We also have a lot of people in Springfield, Illinois and far in between. Um, so there are, the more host homes we establish, the more lives we can impact. And honestly, we have had a lot of great success 
with the host homes program. Um, we've even had a lot of people that, you know, we've heard others say, this person will not survive. They have too high of behaviors. There's no way a person would support that in their home, and we've had them flourish um, because they were not in a home with four to eight other individuals. You know, they were getting that individualized attention that they were needing. There we go. So in our host home programs, we have providers um, age 21 and up. In the top photo here, you will see Gretel um, with her host home provider and the provider's cousin. They support two people in their home. Actually, they have um, the provider has purchased her own home, and the two ladies she supports move with her. However, her cousin still serves as a natural support for them. Um, in the summer, you will find them boating together, watching movies. Uh, they love to be outdoors and very involved in the community. In this bottom photo here, you will see Roger and Bob. Roger and Bob have lived together for 35 years, I think. Um, might be closer to 37 now so. at this point. Yeah. But um, the bond that they have, they enjoy taking daily walks at the mall specifically is where they like to go, where it's nice and air-conditioned inside. Um, and one of their favorite things to do is travel. Uh, Roger intends to retire to Tennessee, and Bob has made it very clear that he wants to go with him. So we intend to support him in doing so, um, Bob being his own guardian. When Roger does make that decision, he can move with him. So most of the people that we support in our host home program do attend a community day program or have a um, community employment. Um, a lot of our providers do continue working or volunteering outside of being a provider. Um, some of them volunteer with Epic, others they still work in the community, or it's a way for them to get involved after their retirement. So in our host homes, kind of like Alyssa said, we support a lot of uh, different types of people, different ages, um, ranging, like I said earlier, from single homes to multiple people in the homes. Um, because each home is different, we look at the preferences of what the person who is being served is looking for, and we also look at the preferences of what the provider is looking for, um, and we try to match those as best as we can. So, you know, we get a lot of um, individuals who are big gamers, and they want to find somebody who is equally interested in gaming like they are. And we don't really have that many problems with that. It's been a great accomplishment for us so far. And, um, you know, when we do our visits at the houses to check in to see how everything's going, they're so excited to tell you, you know, how far they've come with their new provider. Um, we also try to find um, people who are, um, it's supposed to be, you know, it's called host homes. You're opening your home to people. It's trying to be like family inclusive. So as Alyssa stated earlier, thank you. Um, she, we try to find people who are gonna go out and do things that the individual is interested in. You know, we're trying to make them feel a part of their family. Um, and one of the awesome things is that um, our providers become a part of the individual being served's family and vice versa. Um, anytime, you know, maybe the provider needs support, the family is happy usually to step in and give that support. We also provide that support through our DSPs. Um, if the family wants to have their individual home for the holidays, by all means, we'll help you get them home so that they can visit you. Um, so many people would believe that only a married couple would be willing to open their home and provide this sort of um, support to someone. However, 70% of our providers are actually single, and then 57% are female and 43% are male. Um, no matter the living arrangement, our host home team provides the support necessary for the provider to be successful, as well as the person that they support. Okay, so like I mentioned earlier, um, the providers in the host home, or I'm sorry, the providers and the family members um, often become a part of each other's lives, um, and it's pretty 
pretty amazing stuff to see. Um, you know, we do support people who do not have very close family members, and it's an amazing relationship to see develop between the host home provider and the individual. Um, oftentimes, you will hear our individuals call their providers, you know, either mom or dad, or these are our sisters, these are our brothers. So it's something that, you know, it really touches your heart, and it's something we want to keep cultivating. Um, for those of our individuals that do have family that is pretty involved, 87% um, of them live in a host home that have a family that live within 60 miles of them. Um, so we often see the family of the person supported um, act as a national, an additional form of support, like I stated earlier. Um, and EPIC hosts a variety of activities throughout the year for the host home providers and the individuals and the family. Um, our most popular is our Christmas party. It was pretty great last year, if I do say so myself. Um, we had Santa come out, we had food catered in, um, we had a lot of music, we had raffles, and we had a lot of people drive from pretty far, actually, just to have a good you know, two hours with their loved ones and the host home providers. Um, it takes a team effort for a community to thrive, and no matter who's involved, whether your family or not. Um, the support of the provider and the host home team creates a strong sense of community um, that helps the people we support reach their fullest potential. So as mentioned earlier in the presentation, this is Gretel again, um, and Gretel lives with her housemate and provider. Gretel's mother is very, very involved, and Gretel gets um, lots of opportunities to go home and visit with family. Um, and her mother is a very strong advocate for host home. Gretel's mom has shared that this program allows Gretel to live more independently like any other 25-year-old, far more than anyone in our family ever dreamed she would. It has also allowed us the security of knowing that she was not alone and is happy. Gretel has prided herself for what she has accomplished and she is excited to share what is going on in her life. She loves being someone's roommate and it has allowed her to build relationships outside of our family, re our family unit, not reunion. <laughs> okay, so who can live in a host home? Um, some of the qualifications is the person must be on the puns list in order to get into our host homes um, or qualify uh, and meet the requirements for crisis funding. Um, the people we support have all sorts of varying abilities within our host home, and we try to um, meet those as best as we can. Um, let's see. If the host home placement, and I, I'm sure this has crossed your guys' minds, if the host home placement does not work out for the individual and the provider, um, the provider is required to give us a 90-day notice, so that way we can start looking at other opportunities for the individuals to look into. Um, we do trial visits, so we, you know, we do a, a meet and greet for the individual and the provider to be and see if they you know, mesh well. If not, we look for another one. If so, great, we'll move on to another visit. We'll do a dinner, we'll do an overnight, we'll see the house and they can see what room they're gonna be in. They get to see what the family is like if there is a family there. Um, they will spend a weekend with them and then we do an extended visit uh, to see how well they mesh. Because you know, you, you and I meet face to face, I might think one thing and then we, you know, we go to live with you for a week and we think something entirely different. So we wanna make sure that when we place you, you guys are gonna be happy together. Um, and I would say we, don't typically have to move people very much. The initial move-in usually is pretty solid. Um, if we have moved anybody out, it's because the host home provider has decided to retire. Um, we've had some that were like, you know what, we've done this for 15 years. Um, we love our guys, but we also have children that we want to go see that live across the country. Um, so then they work with us and we try to find a new placement for the individual. Um, so it's pretty, pretty neat process and pretty neat uh, department if I do say so myself. So we use our social media accounts as a way to educate others and share about who we are and what we're up to. So feel free to follow along with us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. And then if you guys would like to reach out to us at all about host homes, um, our information is up on the screen and it should be in your packets as well. Please feel free to call or email us with any questions that you have. 
Um, we are not currently in the northern Illinois area. Uh, we are mainly central and southern Illinois. However, we do have a lot of people that are interested in our program from northern Illinois. Um, we have had some families that have expressed interest. Even though it's kind of a far drive, I think from this, we drove three hours today to get here. Two hours? Two hours to get here today. And families have been willing to make that sacrifice because they have really enjoyed the program and seeing how their loved one is uh, doing in our program. So if you are interested or you just have questions, please feel free to reach out. We would love to answer them for you. Questions? Okay. The number one question, the funding. So yes. they have a Medicaid waiver. How does it work? How do, are the host families paid? And then what happens if, you know, if they need additional supports? So um, the funding for host family also falls under 60D. Um, so it's funded exactly the same as a group home would be. The main difference is that in a host home, the provider or I mean they are DSP trained, um, they're allowed to sleep at night. So there is no third shift per se. Um, however, like in a group home, you know, you have the rotating shift staff. So it is funded the same way. Um, I, if additional support is needed, then unfortunately the state of Illinois has said that 53R and whatnot, um, if they need that, they can't live in a host home, which is a battle that we are you know, trying to fight because the thing is, is that we do have people who have considered more challenging behaviors in our host home program. We have an on-call system. If that staff has to go out, then I would count that as an added support. However, there's no way for us to bill for it. Um, that doesn't mean we don't provide that support. We still go, of course, however, the funding for that isn't there anymore. Thank you for being here. Do you recruit host homes? Uh, are you actively recruiting? Mm -hmm. you know, how, how does that work? Yes, so um, as the recruiter, I do go out to quite a few events. Um, we are part of like the Springfield Chamber, the Metro East Chamber, and the Peoria Chamber as well, so we do attend a lot of those events. Um, looking to get a little bit more involved with foster parent groups. Uh, lately, we've had quite a few foster parents that want to convert over to being a provider. Um, and we've had a lot of success with that. The person that I'm specifically thinking of, the gentleman would have had a harder time adjusting to someone else's home. However, since his foster mom had adopted his younger siblings, it was a perfect transition for him. So each case kind of varies. Um, we also see a lot of our staff that work within our day program or our group homes as they decide to retire. They choose to be host home providers as well. Um, anything else to add to that? Um, so we also have get quite a few referrals for host home providers through other providers. Um, so word of mouth is probably our best way as well. Uh, we have a lot of um, providers that will tell their friends, their family members. You know, um, it's it's a pretty nice setup to where you don't have to have a second job if you don't want to, depending on your lifestyle. But if you want to, you can. Um, so like we stated in our presentation earlier, that most of the host home providers uh, have a second job on top of being a provider. However, the provider is their main job and we make sure they know that that is the priority. So if something were to happen with the individual, they would need to leave their second job to come and take care of them. What, you know, maybe they get ill at day program or, um, you know, the bus does not show up to pick them up from their community job. Um, so that is a priority. Um, and then we also have providers um, that hear from us through our Facebook pages. We're trying to get out there more. Um, we're putting, we're actually, we actively go into the communities and we're putting up flyers at local businesses and trying to recruit that way as well. Tell the stories, you know, tell the stories. You know, those little video clips mm -hmm. and things. Tell the stories, you know, have the hosts, yes. you know, yeah. and their residents tell their stories. I mean, wow, Well, nothing. And, 
Oftentimes, like, we bring one of our individuals with us to these events. However, he was um, already scheduled for another event in a different part of the state today. <laughs> so we would have brought him with us, and you could have heard a live account from him of you know his story. He went from being you know up in this area, I believe, actually, and then came down to us. He was living in his own apartment, um, and then you know decided he needed more support than what he was getting, and so he came into our host home program, and now he's flourishing. His medical issues are starting to clear up and he's really come out of his shell like before I could not get him to talk to me at all and now I can't get him to stop calling my phone and I can't get him to stop texting me so it's really a great opportunity when our guys can come out with us and typically they do but today he could not join us I'd also like to add on to your first question sorry I realized it just dawned on me that I didn't answer this part how providers are paid um, so when someone comes into services, an agency fills out what's called a 60D application, a funding packet, and the provider receives 53% of that amount, um, and they receive it as a monthly stipend. And that could range anywhere from 25,000 a year to 65,000 a year, depending on how many people they support as well as the level of need that the person is going to have to provide, level of support that the person is going to have to provide, sorry. Um, and they receive it monthly. Now, if you have two people that have higher needs, of course your stipend will be higher. Um, I know probably a lot of you have a question about burnout as well, because it would be a lot to be a 24 hour DSP for someone. Um, so we provide 20 hours of relief per month to the provider. So that would be like if they had a doctor's appointment or something that the person said, no, I don't wanna go with you to that. Then our staff would come into the home the person does not leave their home for support, um, our staff go in. And then they also get 14 days of paid vacation time per year. And you have a question? Yes, uh, host, host home model. Mm -hmm. uh, can you please elaborate on it? Because the previous uh, presenter did not say, is it SILA, is it something like that? Yep, it is considered a SILA. Each site is licensed. Um, it has to pass a fire marshal inspection as well as a DHS inspection. Um, essentially, it works the same way as a group home, so the same sort of funding for that. The only difference is that the staff is allowed to sleep in a host home at night, and in a group home, you have the 24-hour shift staff. In an instance where one of your uh, being served uh, has no family, mm -hmm. do you ever become their guardian? So a provider could not necessarily be the guardian for someone. However, we would support them in finding a guardian. So if they had, I know you said no family, but if they had maybe an extended family member, a distant cousin that was interested, if not, we would look for a state guardian. Would you accept the responsibility for getting, in the case that one of these people, say, burns out or passes away or whatever, would you be responsible for placing them in the next place? Yes. So we actually just recently had that happen unexpectedly. Um, so we were there immediately, uh, literally within hours of it happening, and was able to move that person uh, and provide him counseling and therapy services in order to help him through that, because that was very difficult for him. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to touch on that real fast. Part of how we said, you know, the host, I'm oh, sorry. Part of how we said the host home family provider becomes a part of the family um, and a part of the individual's life. In that instance, um, one of the great things was the providers, the provider who passed away, their family members stepped up to also provide support for that individual. And they were very quick to say, we would like to take them in. What do we need to do in order to become a host home provider? Yeah. Unfortunately, it did not work out because um, they were expecting a child and two children, excuse me, they were expecting twins. And um, the amount of people that we can support in a house at one time or a provider can have in a house is six. And that would have pushed them over the limit of what we would be able to have in the house. Um, but they still stepped up to the plate and they wanted to take care of this person until we could find a new placement for them. 
I'm just curious what kind of vetting you do for about the host families. I mean, background checks, um, you know, medical checks, that kind of thing. Yes, absolutely. So they do have to fill out and complete a background check as well as fingerprinting. They have to pass a drug test. They have to um, go through a credit check as well. We do a home study. We also run background checks on any frequent visitors of the home or uh, anyone over, I believe it's 16 and older, we run a background check. Um, and then they have to complete like any other job interview. Uh, they also go for a physical assessment and a lift test as well. Yep, so they're required to go through DSP training. Uh, we provide that to them, and then they also have to go through on-the-job training. There is EPIC-specific, what we call CBTAs, it's basically, or OJT, on-the-job training. Um, part of that, you know, they are learning about lifting and transferring. They're learning about what it means to be in a host home. Uh, one day they go and shadow another host home provider so they can have their questions answered. Um, we, I'm, it's something we're working on starting back up again, but we used to offer monthly huddles as well, where people who were in the process of becoming a provider could link up with veteran providers to discuss what it would be like for them. Um, because we wanna make sure that they know what they're getting into. It is a lot to take on. And then they also have to be CPR and first aid certified. I don't remember if I said that, but we provide that to them as well. And then they also have to go through a med authorization training um, in order to help pass medications for the individuals. Um, we try to encourage the individuals to be able to pass their own medications if they can. If it's apparent that they cannot, then that is where the host home provider would step in, take that training, get certified, and pass their medications for them. Yeah, I'm curious about the um, vetting or assessment to, to determine if it's the right kind of setting for the individual uh, who will be placed in the, in the home as well as if there's a waiting list. So there is a waiting list. Um, however, it's due to like hard preferences that the individual does not want to give up. So say they wanna live in a certain geographical area and we don't have a provider ready at that moment, um, then we let them know as soon as we do have somebody in that area. And then we do an introduction to see if they would match uh, well enough to proceed with um, more trial visits and such. Um, the I will say, if the individual, and I think a lot of people have this idea, um, we just go if, it the, if we think they'll work out, if the placement we think is gonna be great, um, and the individual doesn't have a voice. That's not true. If the individual feels that this placement that we have presented them is not going to work, then we will not proceed, and we'll let them know when we do have something that would work for them. Right now, I'm in the process of trying to place a couple of people who really want to live in the Springfield area. Unfortunately, right now, I don't have a Springfield provider, but we're actively looking and trying to recruit in that area so that they can be placed there. We do offer placement somewhere else temporarily. I've given them the option, hey, I do have providers open in this area. Would you like to try and live with them and meet them and see how it goes until we do have you know, an opportunity in the Springfield area for you to move back down? And some of them are open for it, some of them are not. It depends on how they're comfortable they're living right now. Um, it just depends on the person and the situation. I have a question. You mentioned briefly that you just only serve like in the central area of Illinois. Are you planning in the future to expand your service area or just talk to, to groups in, in this area to, to see maybe this can be replicated? Well, mm -hmm. What do you see this going? Yeah, so we are, sorry. We are looking to expand our services. Even though we're not currently in this area, it's always a possibility um, due to Um, so there was something that prevented us from coming into this area for a little bit of time. Um, however, I believe that's kind of expired. So it's a possibility. We don't have any sort of timeline right now. So the furthest north would be Stark, Stark County. Are your host home providers trained and prepared for the transition for someone who's going to be moving in who maybe already has lived with family and now they're 
no longer in that comfort zone, do they know, are they gonna be prepared for what may ensue? Absolutely. During, during the transition? Yes, um, so once they have someone, like once we've identified someone that they're going to support and we've gone through all of the visits that we require, of course if there's family members, we want them involved. So maybe one night that means the family comes over and has dinner with the person that will be supported in the home and the provider. Maybe they all go out together once a month and get go to a movie or something. Um, if there is family, we definitely encourage that involvement. Like Gretel's mom, she's very involved. She's at every event. Um, her and the provider and Gretel will go out and do things together. And once we identify that placement, they also have to go through a five-day orientation where they're trained on that person specifically and how to best support them. So if they have a behavior plan, they're going to meet with our behavioral health services and explain that plan and any possible scenario that could potentially happen so they're prepared to respond to that. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so the providers, what... What's the scope of the, of the responsibilities they take on? Like for example, medical appointments or things like that. Is that a provider or is there staff? How does that work? Yep, so the provider is the 24 seven staff member. So they're responsible for the medical appointments, any um, assistance that they need with activities of daily living, so hygiene, showering, cooking meals, transportation, all of that, that is the provider's responsibility. They also have to document daily. We personally use Therap, and then we use a program called ECP, which is an electronic MAR on the computer, so they have to document the med passes. Um, and then at the end of the each month, they have required paperwork they have to turn in, so they have to do a monthly drill. They have to do a um, account reconciliation, so they keep every receipt in order and balance out the checkbook. Um, so it, it is... Uh, you have to be pretty committed to be a provider, and we make sure that they understand that before they start the process. Um, during the interview, we're very thorough, and we throw tons of questions at them. And unfortunately, you know, once we get so far in that, a lot of them say, "Oh no, I didn't, I didn't realize that. Never mind." However, if someone makes it through that, then you can tell they have a commitment. Any other questions? Oh. What's the primary motivation for what do you what what prompts people to become providers? If that's even a question you can answer. Yeah. So from my experience, um, I see a lot of people that are they've been involved with this population some way somehow. So either they have experience as a DSP, or they might have a child who receives services theirself. Um, so most of the time, people are involved. Other than that, I would say um, medical field. the medical field. So uh, we do have providers that have been like past nurses or doctors that have retired and decided, you know what, this is what I want to do now. We also see a lot, sorry. We also see a lot of providers come from, um, like we stated in earlier, the foster care program, how we touched on that one guy who came over from, um, oh no, you're fine, from his uh, foster family and they decided they wanted to take him on further on. Um, he displayed quite a few behaviors that probably would have been hard for a, a brand new provider to take on and his family was already established to it. They already knew how to handle it um, and the fact that they wanted to continue that care. So we do see quite a few people come from the foster care side of things. Um, unfortunately, you cannot be a foster parent and a host home provider at the same time because it all falls under the same funding. Um, so they would have to relinquish their foster parent license in order to become a host home provider. I also just want to add really quick that it is a tax-free income because it falls under the Illinois Foster Care Act. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Oh, I'll be right there. I was just wondering if you guys are seeking um, any partnership opportunities with other agencies, especially in the northern region, to try to grow this program? Um, it's definitely something that we are open to, and we'd be happy to leave our contact information so we could further discuss that. That would be great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else?
Can a host be an extended family member? How extended, I think, would be the answer to that. I don't know that we've ever had a scenario like that. I know for sure it couldn't be parents or grandparents, but say a third cousin, I, I'm not 100% sure on that answer. Mm -hmm. Siblings. Sibling cannot. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I just wondered if there are any organizations in Northern Illinois that have a similar program to yours. Um, the only one, and I don't know, what, there's been so many names, so I, I don't know if I'm going to tell you the correct name, but possibly Illinois Mentor or Savita. Um, other than that, I don't personally know of anyone else up north. Do you know of anyone? No, those are the two. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can, um, can the person living in the home be left alone in the home if they're capable to be left alone? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So for us, we do a home alone and community alone safety assessment. Uh, we do that with the person. We ask them the questions, the scenarios, what would you do? Um, they can have up to six hours of home alone time, and then they can also have up to six hours of community alone time. And the community time would not count like if they work in the community, that doesn't count towards their time. But if they rode the bus to work by themselves, that would count. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that a resident can take a day program. Mm -hmm. So are funding enough to cover housing and day program, or they come from different sources? No, it's the, it's the same. So normally that's all built in together. Um, so we're able to do that. And just because they live in an epic host home doesn't mean they have to go to our day program either. They're open to explore other local areas that are in the area. Anybody else? Okay. All right. Linda? Thank you guys for having us. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs>